Joining us now is Juhi An, Senior Portfolio Manager located in Hong Kong, and Malcolm Dorson, Senior Portfolio Manager based in New York. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. 2020 has been plagued by the effect of the COVID pandemic. Can you discuss how emerging market countries have responded and the investment implications of, of those responses? Hmm. Um, first, the Northeast Asian countries such as China, Taiwan, and South Korea have contained the virus outbreak in a faster and more effective way in early stages. Although some parts of these areas have seen the resurgence of virus infections recently. Um, especially in China, there have no new locally transmitted cases for several days so far. And even Wuhan, uh, the center of the, the epidemic in China, is almost back to normal life as we see large outdoor events and resumption of offline classes. Um, this implies some interesting changes from the, uh, the investment perspective. First, uh, domestic tourism is becoming more attractive than outbound tourism to Chinese consumers. They feel safer in local areas since the pandemic situations in other global cities are yet to be stabilized. And second, um, the Chinese consumers became more confident in its, its local brands than foreign, foreign brands as their country's containment seems better than other major countries. The younger generations already had a tendency to have more pride and trust the made in or made by China products uh, already even before the pandemic uh, compared to older generations. But the better containment of the outbreak by the quicker and more effective response of the Chinese government makes that trend stronger. Third, some sectors that were less penetrated online are set to show higher growth as they are being connected to online technologies with strong support from the government as well as consumers behavior changes. Um, the online healthcare in China is one of the examples of that. The having said that, we are still mindful of the second or third wave of the virus outbreak and carefully watching the government measures and effects. Yeah, and um, just in addition to that, as uh, Juhi mentioned, that uh, um, Asia and it's North Asia specifically have done a, a tremendous job in 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 kind of having the the first mover advantage in in locking down this virus and have really been able to to come out of it earlier than the rest of emerging markets and really earlier than than the developed world. So they're seeing that that first in first out advantage, where in ex Asia we've been seeing. Um, a sort of a diverging um, situation uh, between the economic impact and the health impact. So uh, unfortunately, from the health standpoint in, in ex-Asia and emerging markets, uh, the situation continues to deteriorate with, with uh, contagion and death numbers con continuing to increase. But from an economic in, uh, perspective, um, we still see this as uh, significantly less severe than in the developed world. Um, and essentially that's coming because these countries don't have the, the luxury of the U.S.'s credit ratings or the ability to print money without restraint, which means that their governments and, and their central banks can't keep their economies frozen while still keeping their citizens or, or their voters in, in good shape. So, so bottom line, they've had to and they continue to open up their economies um, sooner than the U.S. and sort of in line with the pace that we've been seeing in Asia, which means that we are seeing a normalization of economic activity, people going back to work, people spending again and consumer confidence picking up and that's translating into earnings as well. Great. Thank you both very much. Uh, what has been the investment team's response to these challenging times? And was there any repositioning done during the second quarter rally? Well, I think as, as bottom-up fundamental investors, you know, we run fairly concentrated portfolios. Uh, we're very comfortable with the fundamentals of of the names in uh, of, of our holdings. So, what we've really been doing is is taking advantage of the, of the volatility that we've seen and increased positions in, in in high conviction names as we see prices dislocate from from normalized fundamentals. Um, and in addition, taking advantage of some thematic shifts uh, across uh, all regions in, in emerging markets. Just to add some uh, on that, uh, the, as the epidemic was becoming the global pandemic and turning out to be a long battle, our investment team tried to find the structural and fundamental changes that will possibly last for the following years, even after the pandemic stabilizes. 
Um, for example, the changes of consumers' mindset in the healthcare sector or the com company's new investment plan in their IT infrastructure, including cloud adoption, and the regulation changes from the governments to enhance the country's capability to control another potential crisis going forward, and so on. So we believe these, these are more structural changes rather than short-term trend. So based on this, we increase our position in healthcare sector as we expect it to uh, benefit from more health-conscious consumers and larger scale uh, deregulations in the sector. Also, we increase online sector exposure as it penetrates untapped users during the crisis and we see them being more regular users. Juhi, looking ahead, what are the significant tailwinds for EM right now? Um, the current valuation gap between emerging market and developed market is almost record high for the last 15 years, with 12 months for PE of emerging market and developed markets are about 15 times and 21 times respectively, and trailing PB of two regions are 1.8 times and 2.5 times. So more interestingly, the earnings growth of emerging market is expected to be higher than that of developed market for this and next year which is reversed from the last few years trend. So we believe that this will appeal to um, the investors who have not had enough positions in emerging markets. Great. Since late March, the, the US dollar has fallen approximately 10% against a, back, a basket of other currencies uh, around the globe. Malcolm, how, how is the weakening US dollar an additional tailwind for EM? Um, well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very positive driver for, for emerging market equities. Um, historically, and including in this most recent period, emerging market, market equities generally gain about 400 basis points off each 1% down move in the broad US dollar index. And, and it's, it's a powerful driver for, for emerging market economies and the companies within them for, for a couple of reasons. Um, I guess first, though, though emerging market countries boast really strong and dynamic growth prospects, They've, they've historically had relatively shallow capital markets and have preferred to fund these growth opportunities um, via U.S. dollar denominated debt. So with that said, when the U.S. dollar weakens, um, their balance sheet shrink as well and net interest expenses go down. And then we start seeing companies uh, present positive earnings revisions. And in addition to that, a, a weaker U.S. dollar generally translates into small, stronger commodity prices. So that benefits the, the more cyclical um, commodity exporting countries as well. We've, we've discussed uh, some tailwinds here. What about headwinds? Is there anything that the team is avoiding? Um, we have a very uh, selective approach to South Korean market, which is the expert oriented economy. It has fallen into recession due to um, the global pandemic's impact. As, uh, as about 40% of the economy comes from exports. And uh, the domestic demand is also uh, very weak to support the overall economic growth as its consumer momentum is still held back by a house, very high level of household debt and also sluggish wage and employment growth. Therefore, we only hold few names in South Korea um, that can benefit from growing demand for cosmetics in China or benefit from increasing online penetration in the local country. Um, yeah, and, and I think to, to go in line with, with what Juhi mentioned, uh, we are very much bottom-up fundamental stock pickers, but, but we have to pay attention to, to geopolitical trends and, and macroeconomic situations to, to make sure that, that we're avoiding landmines at, at all costs. So with that said, um, in, in addition to, to that, we've, um, we've been avoiding exposure in, in Turkey and, um, and really maintaining minimal exposure in South Africa, given growing twin deficits in both countries, uh, opaque political situations, and for Turkey, uncertainty around the independence of their central bank, and for South Africa, generally just the, the, the strength of their, their institutions. Okay, shifting to politics, uh, the, the U.S. presidential election is... is going to be quickly upon us. What does this mean for EM? Um, well, it's funny. EM has set itself up in a way where it's almost a win-win. So uh, a Republican win would signal more isolationism, higher tariffs, lower U.S. unemployment, and ultimately more inflation, which should weaken the dollar and, and present a boost for EM equities. 
Um, a democratic victory, on the other hand, could imply a return towards more free trade, cross-border opportunities, uh, improved government relationships, and, and really better sentiment across emerging market economies. And um, both for, um, in, in, in either case, we think that we could expect more hawkish rhetoric for, for probably both China and Russia. Um, Russia specifically, we think that the current administration has shown that it really has no intention to interfere with the Russian economy. But with, uh, with the Biden victory, we probably would expect more, more targeted sanctions on individuals uh, relating to mostly election interference and possibly the, the recent alleged Navalny poisoning, but no uh, actual moves against the, the actual economy as um, we think that that would probably hurt more innocent people more than, than bad, the bad actors themselves in this case. Okay. Uh, if Mm -hmm. The emerging Asian market as well could be volatile as um, more talks tend to come out of each camp approaching the election, especially China market and the, some companies in China that have recently been, been targeted by the go U.S. government may show higher volatility of share prices. However, um, as we have seen in 2016 and 17, this kind of volatility could offer good buying opportunities for high quality companies where earnings growth will still be robust. We'll, um, so we'll try to take advantage of any excessive share price movements if they are not driven by their fundamentals. Great, thank you. Uh, something that's been in the press a bit lately has been the reemergence of US-China trade tensions. Uh, Juhi, is this something that, that you watch closely and, and consider an additional headwind? How, how, do, you, how do you view that? Uh, definitely, it is one of the key issues that we are closely watching since China accounts for the biggest part of our fund. But we believe this tension will eventually help China's um, domestic consumption grow faster. As the, uh, the importance of the domestic market grows to support, to, uh, support the overall economy, uh, the Chinese government has introduced lots of more effective and efficient uh, policies and measures to boost domestic demand growth. The U.S.-China trade tension has um, is escalated to many different aspects of business, economy, and politics recently. So we may see more share price volatility of the stocks that we previously believed are, are, are not subject to the U.S. and China trade conflict. Still, we consider this kind of volatility as long-term buying opportunity rather than a headwind, as long as its earnings growth will be strongly supported by this huge 14 billion population local market. Of note, this economy is recovering at a much faster than expected rate from the pandemic too, at this moment. Great. Um, the, the, the US and China are the two of the largest economies in the world. Malcolm, does this, this must have some follow-on effects outside of China and, and Asia at large. Uh, can you discuss that a little bit? Um, absolutely. I mean, outside of China, within Asia and, and the rest of emerging markets, um, China's economy delivering positive growth this year and next year is an incredibly uh, bullish development for, for global sentiment and especially for emerging market equities. Um, the, the country and its economy returning to to, to growing north of their potential is, is analogous to, to commodity prices seeing support, uh, the US dollar losing additional value, which um, we already discussed is, is a positive for EM equities. And, um, and as EM equities trade stronger, that, that leads to lower inflation, higher purchasing power, and, and also falling risk of material social unrest. So all of this is, is very much a positive for, for the asset class as a whole. Great, thanks very much. Shifting back to the fund, the fund invests in the, the big picture consumption growth story in emerging markets. Are there additional investment themes or sub themes that you're focusing on? Yes, um, the, the development of internet plus healthcare infrastructure uh, looks very attractive to me. The COVID-19 pandemic changed consumers' behaviors to be more health conscious. Also, especially in China, the strong support from the government through deregulation, as well as 5G rollout, is building the milestone for solid nationwide integration of online medical, and also pharmaceutical, and uh, medical services, etc. So it will benefit the companies that are specialized in telemedicine and also uh, pharmaceutical e-commerce. 
Yeah, um, in, in very much in line with what Juhi mentioned, um, those have been major sectors um, for, for the fund and themes for the fund. Um, in addition to that, we're, we're seeing similar trends in, in financials and banks uh, as banks, you know, they already have the powerful story of financial inclusion, given the low penetration rates of, of banking clients in emerging markets. But now we're seeing them move away from traditional brick and mortar branches and more towards uh, investing in digital platforms, which allows them not only to cut their costs, there's roughly 60, 65 percent of operating costs come from personnel working at those branches, but uh, it allows them to, to boost their income as well, because um, you are with a digital platform, you're collecting more data, you know when your clients are spending, where they're spending and how they're spending. So that allows these banks to, to make more informed decisions in regards to their loans and uh, reduce their, their credit risk and improve their, their, NPL, uh, their NPL rates. Um, in addition to that, it opens up the door for cross-selling opportunities. So these banks can now also start tap targeted pushes, not only towards their uh, you know, savings and loan products, but also more towards insurance, mortgages, brokerage platforms, and, and much more, giving you operating leverage, uh, more operating leverage per in individual customer, and ultimately improving your, your margins and your earnings expectations. Those are great insights. Thank you both. I'm going to direct this question to you, Malcolm. EM currently accounts for 11% of the global equity market, but global equity investors only have approximately a 5% allocation to the class. What is the case for investors to increase their EM exposure and close that gap? Yeah, um, you're right, Bob. Investors have been uh, very underweight recently, and, uh, and I think uh, a lot of that is because how, how well the U.S. has done over, over the past 10 years. But, um, but I think that... It, uh, presents an ex uh, a very strong opportunity for emerging market equities. Juhi already mentioned the, the valuation disconnect, and, uh, and we're seeing a significant amount of interest um, for various reasons. I mean, one, you still, for long-term investors, you still see emerging markets present that powerful long-term structural story uh, based off of low penetration rates, catch-up opportunities. Um, the asset class also benefits from attractive demographics and natural resources, low-hanging fruit in regards to economic and political reforms. Um, and then for us, the way that, that, that we look at, at the product, um, probably most importantly, we see a powerful structural opportunity as we're witnessing economies shift away from asset heavy, low return industries, such as manufacturing and construction and commodities, and really more towards services, innovation and, and high return business models. Um, and I guess from a more tactical perspective, um, we're, we're seeing an advantage for emerging markets in, in both GDP and earnings growth versus developed markets. Um, so that is causing people to look at reallocating their, their allocations. Um, we're also seeing, as we discussed, the recent movement and continued outlook for a weaker U.S. dollar. Um, and, and really probably mostly is that investors are looking for, for diversification out of the U.S. Um, considering the pandemic and, and, how, and the U.S.'s response to it, um, considering that we're seeing protests across almost every major U.S. city um, and, and building social unrest, um, heightened geopolitical tension between the U.S. and its most important trading partners, U.S. unemployment at 80-year at historical highs, um, rising uncertainty uh, about the upcoming U.S. elections and all of that and U.S. equities still continue to rise and, and push multiples to the expensive side. So I think in general, the allocators that we're speaking to are, are looking to, to diversify themselves from a regional perspective and emerging markets just continue to present a more and more attractive opportunity. And one last question before we break for today. Uh, Juhi, how does active management add value in EM equity? Um, we see massive investment opportunities that cannot be captured by passive investing in emerging markets as lots of different growth patterns in various sectors appear compared to the emerging stage of the U.S. and Europe in the past. For example, the consumption behaviors of emerging market consumers are already catching up with or even ahead of the developed market consumers as they adopt new technologies much faster. Therefore, um, the current market benchmark, which is backward looking and, and actually not reflective of the fast changes of emerging market, is not a proper benchmark to capture these newly growing opportunities. For example, if you look at China H share index, it shows only a mere performance since the global financial crisis 
as it's more skewed to all the economy uh, related sectors. But we can find many names in new economy sectors that show multi bigger um, performance um, during the same period. To pick the competitive uh, companies that we believe will generate strong earnings growth regardless of the macroeconomy uncertainty, uh, strong, uh, strong bottom up research, under, also the underground um, research are the most critical part of the investment process. So emerging market is still very uh, inefficient, so we believe that active and selective investment will be the key to success in emerging markets. Terrific. I, I want to thank you both for, for taking the time to join us today. I think it is going to give investors uh, some insight into to, to the, how the fund is managed and um, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.